Watts. Destination ahead. The area known as Watts is located on the 1843 Rancho La Tejada Mexical land grant, an area known for grazing and beef production. With the influx of European American settlers into Southern Cal in the 1870s, La Tejada land was sold off and subdivided for smaller farms and homes, including a 220 acre parcel purchased by Charles H. Watts in 1886 for alfalfa and livestock farming. The arrival of a railroad spurred development of the area, and in 1907, Watts was incorporated as a separate city, taking its name from the first railroad station, Watts Station, that had been built in 1904 on 10 acres of land donated by the Watts family. Watts was used by the city of Los Angeles to open up the gateway uh, to San Pedro so that the movement of oil and other commercial uh, transportation could take place in a way that created a, a link down to the harbor and the ships waiting for cargo and so on and so forth. So uh, Watts is a critical transportation uh, link for the entire region. Um, there are more transportation, uh, commercial transportation modes uh, that traverse the community of Watts than probably any other community um, in California. And then you have all the normal stuff that most communities have with, um, you know, metro rail and, and um, the, the buses. And yes, you do get yellow taxis down here uh, and um, Dash and I believe City Ride also serves this community. As a stop on a railroad line, Watts attracted many railroad workers. At first, whites, then later, blacks, as whites began moving out. In 1926, the city was consolidated with Los Angeles. Watts did not become predominantly black until the 1940s, as the Second Great Migration brought tens of thousands of migrants, mostly from Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Texas, who left southern states for better opportunities in the city. During World War II, the city built several large housing projects, including Nickerson Gardens, Jordan Downs and Imperial Courts for the thousands of new workers in war industries. By the early 1960s, these projects had become nearly 100% black as whites moved to new suburbs outside of the city. As the industrial jobs disappeared, the projects housed many more poor families than they had traditionally. Long-standing resentment by the LA working class blacks over discriminatory treatment by police and inadequate public services, especially schools and hospitals, exploded on August the 11th, 1965, into what we know as the Watts Riots. I saw people, you know, some of them had been cut with glass was broken, and then how the military came in and saw all of that, you know, it was scary. The name Watts evokes uh, various things in people's head around the country and they think about violence because of the what, 1965 Watts riots. And um, Watts is having a hard time getting that stigma eradicated. As a poor public policy, I'll talk about the war on welfare. They call it the war on poverty. It's a war on welfare. Welfare means that you're doing well. It's a welfare, we're, we're faring well. And they started that welfare system, uh, you know, with a focus on general relief and um, health and hunger. It wasn't meant to become an occupation. It was meant to be a transition, a tool to get from abject poverty and into the mainstream of self-sufficiency. It didn't happen that way because the public policy that governed welfare forced families to break, destroyed black families across this nation to the extent that uh, we saw the back of, of black families broken by that welfare policy. 
um, it, the policy said um, to the woman, you've got these young children, you can get food stamps, you can get medical care, you can get uh, you know, cash, you can get all of the benefits that we provide as long as your husband is out of the picture. The program was meant to, to help people fare better, to, to fare well. Uh, and instead, the rules and the regulations underneath it actually caused them to do worse because it encouraged the young girls to see that, oh, if, if I have a baby, I can get money. Oh, and if I have two, I can get more. So I'm not opposed to welfare, but I am adamantly opposed to the idea that uh, people should be punished for being uh, in poverty and um, inhibited or prohibited from making their way into self-sufficiency. I'm a strong advocate for mental health. I've watched within the African-American community drugs destroy not only our families but our community. We're suffering from mental illness and there's many layers that the African-American has suffered from civil rights, from slavery, to economic, to depression, uh, to broken homes, to father grown alcohol, to cocaine. All of that weighs heavy on our mental, psychic, and we've never recovered from slavery. So then you throw the economic situation in. We never recovered from the economic situation. Then you throw the cocaine in our communities. We've never recovered from cocaine. Then you throw the, the single mothers, fathers gone. Child has never recovered from that. Then you put him in school. He's never recovered from that. Now you have the, the, the demographics of their community of what they called community change on them. But one of the problems within our community is we self-medicate. The liquor stores, alcohol, drugs, and then we wonder what's wrong. In the 1970s, gangs gained strength and raised the level of violence in the neighborhood. Thus, between 1989 and 2005, there were more than 500 homicides in Watts, and most of them gang-related and ties to war over control over the lucrative, illicit market created by illegal drugs. Among the most influential gangs were Piru Bloods, Grape Street Crips, Bounty Hunter Bloods, and PJ Crips. And in April 1992, they formed a peace treaty following four years of peace talks that began in 1988. They said, well, two and three and four people riding together, that's a gang. I said, well then if that's a gang, everybody that I've been around, they're, they're gang members. They're just people in their communities. Um, it started off one way and ended up turning into this big oopla. But you know, since they're in a the low poverty, a uh, low income, uh, basically hungry community, they're grouped as gangs. My acceptance of gangs is real low. I don't believe that our young men and young ladies have to run in a gang to be identified. Over here, we have the Bloods, which is called the Nicholson Gardens. We have the other one, Imperial Courts, called the PJs, which is the Crips. And then you have the uh, Jordan Downs, which is the Grave Streets. So, but you know, when it comes down to it, all of us got family members in every one that you go to. And I have young men come to my church and they tell me, Pastor, I've shot someone. It's a terrible thing, but we're dealing with the effects, not the cause. And as long as we continue in this nation, in this city, to deal with the effects and, and, and instead of the cause, then we will always have gangs. Our families are, are in trouble. I am the chaplain of the Watts Gang Task Force. I've been there with, was in, in the seat about six years ago. And we formed this because of, we, well, I, you know, I hate to call it gangs, but I just call it young people dysfunction in a way. And we like to say groups okay. because um, everybody has rivals. Everybody has um, certain types or titles like UCLA has uh, USC, Coca-Cola has Pepsi. These are all different groups and they all have their little battles. Somewhere down the line, somebody forgot to love our kids, forgot to reach out to our children. 
If they reached out, they reached in the wrong area or direction. Instead of telling them, like our parents would tell us, do not touch that. You know what I'm saying? Some people probably told them it's okay to do certain things. Where we must tell them that's not the way to go. And just because Johnny has a Cadillac, don't envy Johnny's Cadillac. Get you a Chevy because every one of them can reach the same point. It may take you a little while longer to get there, but you can get there. But our young people need to know this, understand it. I said, if you had a job where you were getting a paycheck, making and earning your money, you would feel better because then you can go to bed at night and rest. Then to get out there on the street selling drugs or whatever it is, then hey, you got to look over your shoulder. You got to watch your back because jealousy has formed in the community. And that's what our problem is when they say the gang members. It's because everybody wants power. And at that time, drug, is, and drug is today in some form power to our young people. And that's what I, I don't like about it because I feel that we are destroying our roots, our nation. Drugs are destroying it. After the 1992 rebellion, there was accelerated gentrification, which means those African Americans who could leave Watts and move to other parts of Southern Cal, like the Antelope Valley, Inland Empire, San Gabriel Valley, Orange County, and other areas did just so. This process was also called Black Flight. The black population has been replaced by its successor migrants, primarily Hispanics from Mexico and Central America, as well as a smaller portion of Ethiopians and Indians. Watts is a beautiful place to be in. Um, my views on Watts are completely different since I've been working here for the past three years. People always talking about, you know, Watts is never going to change, it's never going to change. It's a, it's a fishbowl mentality where people are kind of tunnel vision and things aren't going to change and they aren't aware about the beautiful things that exist in Watts and outside of Watts and so if we don't break out of that of that mentality which we are going to remain the same so I'm really trying to encourage people that we are the ones that are going to get empowered here and need to make the decision to take back our community. Watts is a 2.12 square mile neighborhood in Los Angeles with a 61.6% .6 Latino and 37.1% black population. It is a high density, youthful neighborhood with a high percentage of households headed by single parents. We used to be at one point back in the 20s or 30s a predominantly white community and then we became a predominantly black community and now we're a predominantly Latino community and I'd like to tell the story to the world that we don't deserve to be pigeonholed by anybody that looks at us from outside. Don't tell us who we are. Let us tell you who we are. We're a constantly evolving community that has been a, a, a portal, has been a conduit for untold numbers of nationalities that have come from around the world wanting to be in Los Angeles but not being able to just move right into Los Angeles. So in Watts, where there's a great deal of tolerance, despite what the six o'clock news says, in Watts, where different classes of people can work and live side by side in peace, this is a place where we need to tell our story and how we do what we do, which is the ultimate description of culture. In Watts, they get along great. And I know you probably would hear that from anybody who would say it, but I understand the the politics of it, you know, here in Watts. Therefore, it's black and brown. And it's a lot different here in Watts than it is anywhere else because things can get real serious. I mean, if it comes to where, and not only just, I'm not speaking just to gangs, I'm even speaking of families. If a Latino family do something to a black family or a black family do something to a Latino family, it could be all our war, where no one could go to the store, go anywhere. That was in the past. Now we have organizations such as the Watts Neighborhood Council, the Watts Gang Task Force, Watts Century Latino. And what we do is problems such as that, we hit them off before they get started. Because it, we know it won't do any of us any good. We have come to realize that here in Watts, if I'm your neighbor, you're not much different than me. Your struggle is the same struggle I have. So, and I have nothing against anyone who's trying to do the best for my community. I want to do what it takes to make my community work better. 
And if I have to be arguing with you or fighting with you, then we're, we're not getting nothing done. You know, sometime it's gonna be me, sometime it's gonna be you. So why don't we just abolish that and start seeing what we both can do to respect each other. And that's where the Watts Neighborhood Council come in at, and that's where Watts Century Latino come in at. Today, neighborhood leaders have begun a strategy to overcome Watts' violence-prone reputation and impoverished areas. I've been in this community for 48 years. I have not lived in this community, but I have worshiped in this community. So we as individuals have to speak truth to power. And first of all, we have to look at ourselves. Because when we look at ourselves and we say, what is it that we need to do as a community? One thing that we have to do is we have to create policy, not just a, a, a Band-Aid to say, okay, I need a job. My grandson, my sister, my daughter needs a job, a Band-Aid. What we need to is we need to have policy to address, address these issues in our community so that we can move forward. Watts Labor Community Action Committee started because there was a tremendous need for employment, housing, health care, better education, and um, senior services, transportation, uh, in a way many of the same things that if somebody asks you what do we need today in our community, most of those same things. And so I'm challenged here as the next generation of leadership at WLCAC trying to figure out are we just going to be an organization that continues to treat the symptoms of poverty and blame the circumstances on poverty and the people that suffer it like much of the rest of the world does or do we begin to understand what's underneath that poverty and what causes that poverty to continue generation after generation. I have been very blessed to be here for nine years uh, as a deputy and I do understand and I also feel the constituents' needs. I do feel them. <laughs> um, um, my basic principle of working, uh, had, I do have a paradigm, and that is human rights. And we've been talking about, uh, about human rights. And human rights has different generations. First generations are the civil and political. Second generation, sec, uh, social and economical rights. Then we have the third generation, which is environment rights, earth rights, family rights. Jobs, the lack of jobs is an issue that's a point of unity. Uh, public safety, homicides, that's a point of unity. Housing is a point of unity. So those are all the issues that really unifies our community, even though we're different. Neighborhood watchers are very important. It is also very important to empower our neighborhood councils. My name is Robin Patillo. I'm a sergeant at Southeast Station. Um, the unit I run are the senior lead officers, and if you know your senior lead officer, uh, each officer has a small area that he is responsible for. Uh, he has a phone that the city has given him, and so you get to call that officer direct, and that officer is always in that area. He doesn't go to other areas, that's his area. I had prepared something to say, but when I was on my way over here, I started thinking of something, and I, I wanna start with a story. A family gets up in the morning, and they get ready to go to work, and they, you know, they pack up the kids' lunch, and everyone's the kids are going to school, and the parents are going to work. They leave their house. Shortly after, a moving van pulls up, some men not in uniforms, just wearing t-shirts and shorts and whatever, they start going in and out of the house and removing stuff, TVs and stereos and iPods and computers, and they load up the truck and they leave. So then the family, after their long day, come home and they find the door open, so they call the police. The police come in and check. There's nobody in the house but they find that the house has been burglarized. So now these people, after their long day, they came home and now they are victims and they've been violated. So the, the, the officers do what they can. They take a police report and they ask for the prince, the, the, the man that takes the fingerprints to come out. And as the officers are leaving, a neighbor from across the street flags the officers down and says, what, what was going on over there? Why'd the police have to come? And they said, well, there was a burglary. 
So the man says, I was home all day. I saw some, you know, moving truck come up and men go in and out of the house. The, the point, so he saw the suspects, but did he know that anything was wrong? Did he know that anything was out of place? He didn't, because he didn't know his neighbors, and his neighbors didn't know him. If he had known his neighbors, if he'd at least had some idea of what these people are, what they do, were they going to go on vacation? Were they going to move? Did he have their cell phone number? You don't have to sit down and break bread with the person, but you can have their cell phone number and say, Mr. Smith, I, um, I noticed there's some activity at your house. Uh, is everything okay? For a community like Watts, which has peaks and valleys of violence, young people that are hurting young people because they live in such desperation that they're now ill. They don't even understand, in many cases, what is civil behavior? What is rational behavior? What is constructive dialogue? What is a constructive relationship? They don't understand those terms. They're too busy trying to defend themselves, in some cases, against predators. In other cases, they're desperately trying to find a way to, as they call it, come up. Either selling something they shouldn't be selling, taking something that doesn't belong to them, doing something to someone that somehow they think is going to benefit them. I say that in Watts, where my brother Henry Broomfield at the back from Neighborhood Council in Watts knows, Watts tries hard to be peaceful. So when Watts is trying hard to be more peaceful and to be more obedient, less destructive, less homicidal, that's the time that we need the most help. They, we have cleanup, they're doing planting, planting the trees, uh, plants, and you know, so, and they have had some cleanups going on in Watts. And so, doing that, I know that I watch, I mean, our neighborhood council that's in this area haven't been more effective down on this side of town. So, we want to make sure that we be in touch with our neighborhood council, this, uh, this council, and that we start working hand in hand and not only clean up but watch it. And I, uh, we don't want this meeting to just stop right here because we want to see some solutions. This is just a start. We want you to talk to other people. We want you to connect with other people because we, we, what we're looking at right now, we're looking at this is a start. We, we find out what's the problem. Then we're going to identify the problem. Let's come up with the problem, what it is. Then we're going to look at solutions. And then we're going to come back and say, okay, what was done? What, what, what kind of improvement did we make from the last time? And so, I mean, we want it to grow because we want this like we want it to spread like a disease. I know Mr. Greg Brown, you know, he's over transportation for the Watts Neighborhood Council. Um, I hear he's doing great jobs and so I am encouraged. I am going to become knowledgeable about those things and, mm -hmm. you know, volunteer and try to help because I know it is a very important issue. Greg is the David that would stand be before any Goliath. He is a boy of Watts. He has a heart the size of Montana. He will do anything to defend the interests of Watts, but he has to be informed. So I do the best I can to inform him. Special promotion has been given to the museums and art galleries, such as the Watts Towers, the WLCAC, the mother of humanity, and so on. We thought that um, the, the, the cherished Watts Towers, are, as an eighth wonder of the world, deserve to be recognized as one of our primary icons. Uh, but we thought that we can't just complain about all the rest of what's not happening in Watts. We have to do some things, so we created some points of interest. Uh, so you're, you're sitting in one of our points of interest, the Watts Museum, of uh, art history and culture. Um, next door we have the Cecil Ferguson Gallery. Um, the Mother of Humanity um, is the uh, sculpture, the, one of the only of its kind in, in the country that speaks to the role of uh, multi-ethnic women around the globe at the base of evolving and developing uh, civilizations. Uh, that woman has always uh, been one of the key 
uh, proponents for peaceful development. Me being here for the past three years, I've seen uh, the, the beauty, the culture, the, the art, the, the music, the food, like there's a lot of that Watts has to offer. And I think if given under the, uh, you know, given the right opportunity and the right people come in and take the goodness that they got out of Watts and take it back and tell people, just like that domino effect with all that negativity, we put some positivity out there, it, it'll change. Uh, this is actually the set. Um, this was donated from, um, donated from the people at Universal. Um, studio? So, right, the studio. Uh, this piece okay. was done by Alphonse. Um, he built the, the stern, of, I guess, of the ship and the stairway. And then on the inside was actually the set where they filmed the, uh, the scenes where they were underneath in the slave hole. This is the set of Amistad. This is the slave hole. Um, now I want you to uh, realize that this space is actually over exaggerated from the real Amistad. Uh, imagine a third of this uh, taken away and the bodies are be staggered from feet to head, uh, side to side, all the way across. Um, the, the children that posed, there were children from the program and, and adults that were here at WLCAC at the time. The artist that did the most was Charles Dixon. Um, he also did the ones that you see outside and the other one I'm going to show you uh, as we go on. Um, the children and the adults in these modes were in here for about four and a half hours. So it took four and a half hours for, the, for it to, to dry. And when they got out of those modes, you can imagine, they were kind of sore. But they had an a, a awakening, an eye-opening experience. Because it took them four and a half hours for this to dry, but it took eight and a half months for them to travel across the transatlantic. So it pretty much just gave them an eye-opening experience. You know, they were, uh, uh, they, they, they kind of were like filled with the spirit, realizing like, man, four and a half hours is nothing compared to eight and a half months. You know? So from here, uh, slavery, it takes you into modern day slavery. Now, if you were to pan around, you would notice that we're inside of a prison. Um, after the 1800s, um, they abolished slavery, but they made it a form of punishment. So they can only enslave people um, as a form of punishment. So incarceration. So that's why I tell the children that you don't want to get back into slavery. They got a lot of people that went through all of this that died for us to be free. And you don't want to end up back in slavery. So you're born free, it's best to stay that way. Um, when I'm giving a tour, there'll be a lot of kids around here, and some of them be stuck on this side of the line. I'll tell them, some of y'all are dead right now. And they be like, why? Like, beyond this line may cause death or injury. So, you know, they be quick to jump back over on the other side. But I try to tell them, don't ever find yourself on this side of this line, because it's hard to get back on hmm, the side of the line. Hard to get back on the right side of the line. Now, I'm a lucky one. Yeah, I've been incarcerated. Um, I've got a job here at WLCAC. Um, it was only for, supposed to be for a couple of months to make some money so my mom could take care of my daughter. Um, what happened was I got a letter written to the judge. They put me on house arrest. Um, I ended up getting a job back at WLCAC. Three years later, I'm a, a member of Neighborhood Council. Um, I'm off of probation. I no longer do or mess with drugs. I've been sober for over four years. No drugs or alcohol. Um, I can take care of my daughter. I have my own place. You know, and I'm all about the community now with the East Side Riders. My, all my time is spent on making your lives better. So you can't, it can't happen. You can't happen with the right, if the person gives you the opportunity to make yourself better, you can do, you can do better. Uh, this piece is from Ill Gotten Games. Um, Debbie Allen actually donated this piece to the organization for the set of Ill Gotten Games. As a city, Watts has been known for transportation. However, as of recent, 
a transportation divide has left the city with fewer and fewer resources to provide its residents with alternatives to commute from home to work or across town. This is the 103rd Street Watts train station. They like to call it the Kenny Hahn station, named after Kenneth Hahn. He was one of the uh, uh, supervisors that, that was instrumental in making this happen. This, this is a very historical site. So this, this is the historical train station that was built uh, in the early 1900s. What we need right here is more safety, something more secure. We might need cameras. We might, we might need some uh, something to stop the crime that we break this right here. Because don't nobody want to see nobody get killed. My name is Wanchiha Balao, and uh, we're at 1686 East 103rd Street at the old Watts Historical Train Station on 103rd and Grandy in Watts, California. Uh, safety is a, is, is a very important issue. When the children get out of school, it's a big issue. You know, uh, uh, and uh, we have like uh, two fatalities here. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real big problem. It's an issue about no bathrooms, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's uh, graffiti, uh, 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 um, and, and this like uh, this guy crossing in the medium right here. Uh, it's the issue about putting uh, the fence down there. You know, mm -hmm. it's an issue. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And it's an issue about moving the bus benches. Uh, they have to move this bus stop down further. They don't have no handicap signs around here for handicapped people. If something wants to happen here. In this city, a little city of Watts, right, right. Okay. we have over 58,000 people here. Mm -hmm. You know, and in in the 58,000 people, it's mostly children and school. If something happens here, it's no way to contact all the residents here unless you have a system in the middle. The train station is the hub for that. Mm -hmm. It was done in a study in 1994 of the cultural pressing for to put the telecommunication system okay. here. And so the only thing that's now needed for it is the funds to get it done and or, and get it done. Yes. The future of the train station is to preserve it because it is a historical monument and to put something cultural in here. We are just in the planning for that. There's been some, some safety issues around the, um, the station at 103rd because of, there was some robberies and there was some other activities that were done that's not as prevalent to d today as they once was, but there was some issues of safety. We have to be honest, Watts is not a safe place. Would I be here at 12 o'clock at night? No. Would I walk the streets? No. And I'm just being honest. There are some people that can care less about a preacher, a teacher, let alone a police officer. So we have to deal with public safety first. We have to make the streets safe and secure. And then transportation. No one wants to come in because of the, the safety issue. And so yes, the buses shut down at a certain hour, but we have to be honest with ourselves. Uh, who wants to ride the bus here in Watts at 12 o'clock? Who wants to stand out on the corner? The transportation issue is a very close to home for me. My girlfriend currently doesn't own a vehicle, so she's having to travel all the way from downtown LA to the city of Paramount. And it's always in the back of my mind, you know, she's out there at night and it's very difficult for me to try to catch up with her uh, with all the things that I've got going on as well. So I'm, I'm definitely a supporter of, of bringing transportation change through our community because from downtown LA, you've got the blue line that runs all the way down. And so from that, you know, I've seen a lot of things happen at night in our community as well. And it's definitely a concern, not only of the community members, but do uh, investors want to invest their money in something so delicate, a delicate situation has violence and, um, you know, just broken down communities. After 11 o'clock, virtually, Watts is dead as far as transportation is concerned. Other, other areas in, 
in Los Angeles have transportation almost 24 hours, but that's not afforded here. It, this is like, it's just like a ghost town when it comes to transportation here. Some residents choose not to travel uh, at a certain time of day. We will discuss later other pressing matters that this community deals with. Transportation should be its least concern. Comparing residents to Los Angeles per square mile, LA has 8,068 people per square mile. However, Watts has 17,928 per square mile. The blue line that runs through Watts was originally designed to accommodate 5,000 daily passengers. By the end of the first year of service, that number had gone up to 32,000 daily riders and today has excelled to 90,000 passengers per week, showing the need to offer alternative modes of transportation. So how is the transportation in Watts? Well, it's, um, it's not the best, it's decent. I guess the frequency um, working over in South LA and trying to get home on the bus on time, I had to make sure that I took the bus by a certain time to catch this dash, Watts dash, mm -hmm. to take me over to um, where I live near uh, Mona and 111. But it's like the bus would stop running at a certain time, so we had to make sure we got on it at 6 o'clock because that was the last bus. And whilst they can Im improve on the buses running more frequent, um, not stopping at a certain time, maybe stopping at about 8 o'clock versus 6 o'clock, um, I guess law enforcement to just be patrolling and have a better uh, connection with the buses to um, just help secure them and, and let the residents have a more safer environment as they travel. Four separate bus entities and one subsidiary operate within the Watts area. The MTA, Atkinson Transportation Company, and its associated company, South Los Angeles Transportation Company, Torrance Municipal, and Gardena Municipal. These three public entities and one private entity with its subsidiary are by law given exclusive rights to serve within their respective franchised area. A resident of Watts may have to ride on several separate bus systems to reach certain destinations in the immediate area. These transportation systems are uncoordinated and have been forced to cut back service and increase fares over the years because of increased capital and operating expenses. My personal opinion about the bus service around here is terrible. From one year to the next, you never know exactly which bus lines they're going to cut. I was just speaking with Mr. Greg Brown, the transportation representative of the Watts Neighborhood Council. And he was telling me that the new lines, well, they were new lines, the lines that they're going to be cutting. And the hours they're going to be cutting back on the dash buses to where in some communities, uh, dash runs seven days a week. Well, here in Watts, it only runs six days a week. It doesn't run on Sundays, which is a hardship for the people that want to go to church. And, and when it runs on Saturday, it, is, it only runs every hour. You know, every hour. And that's a pretty long wait for a senior citizen in a wheelchair or at a, at a pickup spot, I call them, where there's no shelter. They have to stand or sit on the curb or whatever. I know when it's extremely hot, they, they have no protection from the sun, or even if it's rainy, mm -hmm. uh, they have no protection. And also, in regards to uh, trash, a lot of the riders have trash, and when they board or if they're waiting, they just discard their trash. It's a few bus stops, but um, especially when it comes to the elderly, they're so stretched out that, you know, it's kind of intimidating to even go anywhere. We need to move towards having shelter for the bus stops because, you know, we have a lot of elderly people and young children, especially when it's hot, you know, it's set for, as far as safety measures go, that's one thing that we do need when it comes to transportation. The seniors have a lot of problems just getting places. Mm -hmm. And what I mean getting places, when they get up and go, it's not like me and you getting up and decide we want to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. They have to prepare themselves 
And I mean, they have to bring their medicine, they have to bring their cane, I mean, so on and so on. And uh, with that being done, you gotta have the right type of transportation for them. You can't expect them to fit into a Volkswagen, mm -hmm. you know, because if you do, they are never getting out. So you have to have the right kind of transportation for them. Okay. We're fortunate that we do have WLCAC here mm -hmm. who does a great job, therefore it's transportation, okay. moving our seniors around. Uh, WLCAC's own history uh, in transportation dates back to 1966 when we invented programs such as Dial-A-Ride and, you know, Meals on Wheels and other programs that actually use transportation to get people and services uh, throughout the community connected. We're si I'm sitting here now on a bus shelter that the Watts Neighborhood Council made possible. Along with the Renters Association, we got shelters for our seniors. Across the street is a senior citizen building called McDonald's Courts. And at the time, neither side had a shelter. They had no place for the seniors to sit besides one old raggedy bench. And we fought, the neighborhood council fought, to get shelters for them. One of the major problems that we had was we are on the dividing line of the city and the county. It took us four years for the city and five years for the county. But with the Neighborhood Council hard work and hard pushing, we got it done. You see, transportation is not just um, public transportation or driving. It's the sidewalks, the streets. We were able to get some things done. We we were awarded $50,000 to resurface some streets. We put in um, 150 um, lights in the alleys. You know, I go to other communities and we have, they have, you know, no potholes and um, the streets are clean and pe everyone has community pride. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I know that we are working towards. You know, you, you look at other communities and you call graffiti, graffiti removal line, within an hour it's gone. And that culture does exi doesn't exist in our community of Watts where people don't take that ownership, where it, it's not a, you know, no. I, I'm seeing graffiti happen right now, I'm calling 311. We found uh, the alleyways a lot of times just unkept. So we find really high weeds, uh, a lot of garbage, uh, burned materials uh, that we'll come across. You know, there may be some alleys that you may see here in Watts that would be trashed, but if someone came to our meeting or someone told us that there was an alley that had got out of hand, mm -hmm. couches and stuff throw mm -hmm. down, we get them cleaned. So I know the city has a program going on. They go around twice a month and clean alleys and things of that nature. The Clean Watts Initiative was launched by Joe Buscaino and basically it's, it's self-explanatory. We're trying to clean up the communities. I got involved with it because I am currently am attending Cal State Dominguez Hills, um, studying public relations, and from that standpoint, you know, I thought that it'd be a really good idea to help them out with where I could with what I'm learning. A lot of people, um, this is this might be a kind of a generalization, but a lot of people do educate themselves and leave the community, but. Knowing that, I, I wanted to turn things around and make sure that what I learned was getting put back. Uh, you know, this reciprocal of education is going out and bringing it back and bettering the community which I grew up in. And basically with that, there's sort of an empowerment by calling it We Clean Watts. You know, there, you know our councilman can say we're going to clean Watts, but there's so much he can do. Now, there, we need to come together and, and decide that we, the community, are the ones that are going to clean up Watts and we are the ones that are going to bring back the, uh, the um, you know, Watts, the community back to the people who, it, you know, it belongs to the community, belongs to us. The Watts Neighborhood Council, we have initiated a program and we have um, pretty much chosen our six sites to start off with and um, about two months ago we started and just last week, you know, the fire station, Fire Station 65 is one of the locations, the Imperial Courts, the Nickerson Gardens, um, Grisby Park, and Mufundi, which is 103rd Street, where the coffee house is. Uh, you know, we basically just divided it out and, you know, we put our backs into it and worked because the one thing that I did get from that is people, when they walk by, 
they see what you are doing and you can tell, you know, they start feeling proud for their community and their environment. During the cleanups is I go knock on people's doors and I talk to them and I talk, you know, did you know about this cleaning? And so from a PR standpoint, I'm really trying to tackle a lot of issues in terms of, did you know about this cleaning? If you didn't, why? If you didn't know, why aren't you coming out? Is it because you feel that it's gonna get dirty in one week? Well, why do you think it's gonna get dirty in one week? Do you think there's no um, you know, ownership in terms of, this is my community, so I'm gonna protect it. So if I see graffiti, I'm gonna call it. Everything in Watts just about has to be imported. There, there is, we don't have, they don't have a, a, a lot of the things that healthy communities are supposedly have in order to function. For the last hundred years here, Watts is sort of the bastard stepchild of the region. It, it is last to receive, receive services. Um, it's the first to get cut. Uh, sit down restaurants, stores. We had it at one time before the riots, but those things went away when there was city ordinances put in, in their place for housing only. Two city ordinances are in place that doesn't allow uh, the expansion of commercial um, endeavors in this area. The that the merchants and the developments, you know, is not what it was then because down 103rd Street mm -hmm. from Wilmington to Central, we had stores, we had, uh, the dry goods, the vegetable stores, you know, the meat markets, you just go there and get whatever you wanted. As you know, Watts have a big homeless problem. And at one time, across up under the freeway, we had homeless people. Myself, personally, I hated when they left because they were lookouts. Uh, as you know, Mr. Brown, he's our transportation representative, but he's also the homeless advocate around here. So he know most of them because he feeds them. You know, he takes them lunch uh, from different meetings around here. We have meetings and there'll be food that's, that's left. Everyone know to give it to Mr. Brown, and he take it to the homeless people, you know. So, so they were they were lookouts. They didn't let them touch nothing, you know. So I hated when they had to leave. But um, we had the mayor and the councilwoman them coming out to see the park. We had the ground breaking, and you know they couldn't let the cameras see that, <laughs> you know. So they 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 moved them out. But the park is still secure though. Their neighbors mainly take care of it. We, we did uh, have to remove a homeless uh, person who was in the alley. And generally, I'm a supporter of helping the homeless as well. But with a lot of that comes in sanitary conditions as well for the people around it. And so not only that, they're also blocking driveways, uh, you know, alleyways, which are meant to actually drive by for people to transport themselves from one side of the block to the next. And so one of the bigger issues that we're finding is a lot of the homeless people are bringing um, tons and tons of stuff and blocking alleyways completely, you know? We own Imperial Central Avenue. In Watts, right? Yes, sir, Watts. Oh. Okay. Now, what do you think that, you know, with transportation, what do we need as Well, we need a, we need a, uh, a special somebody that specializes in transportation for us, like just for transportation, not for the office and other things, you know, because a lot of people be waiting at, you know, they be <laughs> van breaking down and stuff. Well, we need we need that transportation. It helps out a lot. It really does. The, the van really helps out and the bus tokens and stuff they get with the transportation. Now, what, what other service do you think that, I mean, being in your condition, what other service do you think we need to make it better for you? Well, you guys are working with me. I mean, you know. Uh, who, who is you guys? Uh, <laughs> oh, my God, my God. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Greg. Mr. Greg Brown, Melina, and Felix are working with me trying to get me a house. They're trying to get housing. And I'm feeling my heart. They went and got my ID for me. They, you know, helped me my social security card. They went and got all the documents I needed to sign up, you know, for, you know, for housing. And, and I, I basically, my heart is going, it's going to work out. They're going to work out. They've been helping a lot of people with housing. Of course, clothing and feeding them. You know, they've been doing a lot for the community. As simple as that. Simple. And, you know, you guys help out a lot. You really do. What is the dangerous part? You know, because you're dealing with transportation. Dealing, uh, I don't know. It's mostly, I don't like hanging out at night. I'm not a, <laughs> right. I don't like the night because, you know, I will, 
the Knickers and Garden, there were some beautiful people over there, some beautiful people. You know, we all know about the Knickers. I mean, they have problems like any other project, mm -hmm. any other house. So it's not, you know, I'm talking about the Knickers, but I'm, I don't, you know, I don't go out too much at night. You know, a lot of, you know, a lot of things happen at night. But uh, as far as transportation for a rig, sometimes I need the night transportation. You know, like they're four or five o'clock, because my doctor's weekend, I switch back doctors, and sometimes I'm supposed to be at four o'clock, and I don't ever make it in time on that bus. So that van really comes in handy unless I leave early, but you know, we all out here doing us, you know, and I forget, and I'm oh, I'm just gonna be too late, and you know, so. But that van, I can call that van up, just somebody, you know, you see, yeah, you work you to death. Greg is a workaholic. This man do so much. God, Jesus. He feeds us, bus tokens, he handles the office, transportation. This man is a, a man, he's a blessing to everybody. You gotta do it just like, hey Greg, hey Greg, he's a blessing to us. He really is a young man here in the watch, you know, in the, in the, in the watch homeless. Okay, he's, he's talking about WLCAC, yeah, watch homeless. Watch Labor Community Action Center homeless. They, they help us so much. Okay, well, like Public transportation is particularly essential to the poor and disadvantaged who are unable to own and operate private automobiles. Only 14% of the families in Watts are car owners, against at least 50% elsewhere within the Los Angeles County. Yeah, right there. Okay. All right. See, see I, I, I don't have to throw it up, but that's what I do. Whenever there's a change in the political climate, that you gotta go right back to the drawing board and draw out information to them to let them know what the needs are, because all of them come with their own perception on what they want to do and who they want to deal with. Whenever you ask the city or the county to spend some money on something, it's always, we, it's cutbacks. But they're always riding around in good, pretty city cars, you know, but it's a cutback. So now you have to re-educate them to what the needs are. And all of them have the same issues. Where are we going to get the money from? If we start a whole system of neighborhood councils and then give them this much guidance. And when they get it wrong, you know, you got it wrong, no, you can't do that. And so they try and get it, to get it done another way. And you're not doing it right. We're going to, you know, you end up in exhaustive efforts or something to got, try to get it straightened out. Whatever their process is, the neighborhood councils deserve um, to be supported in a way that helps them fulfill their mission. Watts was an empowerment zone. And there are many, uh, many pro programs that came about with Watts name in them and they got monies for that, but Watts was not the recipient. Watts has been the bastard child in the city of Los Angeles for a very long time. On Watts back, a lot of monies have been appropriated. Okay, I don't want, you know, a hundred cars every morning rolling into Watts to go to a single job site, but I sure would love to see brothers and sisters walking to work with brown bags from Nickerson Gardens, Hacienda, Imperial Courts, and the members of the former Jordan Downs. Um, what a beautiful day that would be if they were the ones at the front of the line every morning clocking in and getting that prevailing wage. hope. There's a big world out there, a brighter world. This one bus can lead you to places that you never even imagined just by catching one bus. So I would encourage uh, the people in Watts to have hope and to look beyond. Nobody's greater than you. I teach empowerment. God rested. Jesus finished it, so it's up to us. Anything that I can do to help someone, that's what I'm about. The quality here in Watts is livable. It's livable. It could be a lot, of, lot better. We have a lot of people, and I mean a lot. I, I sit on a board with 21 of them that's trying to make it better. I think that our neighborhood council is a power that's waiting to be unleashed. And I understand that the whole purpose of the Neighborhood Council was to hold local elected officials accountable. And when the Neighborhood Councils begin to hold elected officials accountable, then we begin to um, seek 
and demand results. It's all about Watts, and we are a group that really wanted to keep everybody together. If it's about us, without us, it ain't for us. Come visit Watts. Come visit our Watts Towers. Uh, come to our historical train station on 103rd. Uh, come to our shopping centers. Come to our, one of the best restaurants in the city called the Watts Coffee House on 103rd in Wilmington. Desiree will fix you one of the greatest meal in the world. And end by what the young people say in Watts, Watts up. <laughs>